legendary fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin once wrote about the simplistic depiction of good and evil in many fantasy stories and many movies and things like this. Now, she's talking about this simplistic depiction of good and evil in terms of fantasy writing, but I also think that this is going to apply to our study of history and really just life in general. She says, quote, There are lots of fantasies about the battle between good and evil. In them, you can tell the good guys from the evil guys by their white hats or their white teeth, but not by what they do. They all behave exactly alike, with mindless and incessant violence, until the problem of evil is solved in a final orgy of savagery and a win for the good team. Immature people crave and demand moral certainty. This is bad. This is good. Kids and adolescents struggle to find a sure moral foothold in this bewildering world. They long to feel they're on the winning side, or at least a member of the team. End quote. I do agree that in many stories, in many movies, in many depictions and narratives and myths that people take seriously, there is this simplistic depiction of good and evil. And I think that in the real world, things are much more ambiguous. It's sometimes difficult to tell which principles are the good ones and the bad ones, which people are the good guys and the bad guys. Does this idea of good guys and bad guys make any sense anyway? And when these simplistic depictions of good and evil inevitably fall apart in the real world, this can lead to a major psychological issue and point of confusion for a lot of people who are struggling to figure out morality in the world. Instead of easily identified heroes and villains, oftentimes there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of people, states, institutions, ideas that are all conflicting with each other and playing off of each other, each looking out for its own best interest. And the end result of all of that can seem like a chaotic and random mess of outcomes. So I think that many people in the face of trying to figure out good and evil in the world in this way, instead turn to conspiracy thinking, where instead of trying to delve into the details of the muddy, murky waters of all of those hundreds or thousands or millions of incentives and trying to figure out good and evil from there, it's much easier and much more in line oftentimes with what kids have been taught from an early age to instead just identify one bad guy or one villain or one alien that created the pyramids. So to me, this ambiguity and banality of evil is a much more interesting take on this concept of good and evil. And I think probably also more accurate as far as corresponding with the real world. And so all of this brings us to Haruki Murakami's amazing short story, Barn Burning. The story takes place in Japan, where the narrator of the story meets a girl much younger than him, and he begins a relationship with her. Now, in the story, it's a bit unclear if this is simply a platonic relationship of friendship or if there's also a sexual relationship going on. I think it's left a little bit ambiguous intentionally, but there does seem to be certain parts of the story where the narrator describes the woman in a sexual way at various points along the way here. But anyway, the girl is a struggling actress. She's a pantomime, someone who mimics reality, works in the realm of illusion and silence. She works with things that aren't there, disappearances and the spaces between reality. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is what her job is, because 
a lot of those themes of memory and disappearance are going to be major themes of the story as we move forward. The narrator notes that the girl potentially has had a couple of boyfriends and may currently have a couple of boyfriends who help her with money because she doesn't have much. They meet at coffee shops and have long conversations. And during one conversation, the girl is, quote unquote, peeling a mandarin orange while they talk. So she's miming the action of peeling these oranges. And for any of us who are well-versed in fantasy and fiction, oftentimes fruit and in particular the orange can be a symbol of death and sort of a foreboding symbol of things to come. Anyone who's seen The Godfather can attest to this. Anyway, the narrator asks the girl about her work, and he notes that she's very talented at it, and she says, quote, Oh, this is nothing. Talent's not involved. It's not a question of making yourself believe there is an orange there. You have to forget there isn't one. That's all. End quote. So we have this tension between believing something versus forgetting that something isn't true. And there are going to be symbolic ramifications for how we come to terms with what eventually is going to happen to the girl, just like the orange that doesn't exist and has disappeared. She is going to disappear by the end of the story. And I think this theme also points to the really alarming nature of the simplicity of evil. Again, as we mentioned earlier in the podcast with that Ursula Le Guin quote, oftentimes evil is not a sort of easily identified thing that people believe in. Oftentimes it's a much more murky forgetting of something that should be true or a refusal to acknowledge morality, or a simple going about the day-to-day -day business of life without realizing the evil ramifications of certain actions. Interestingly enough, about a sentence or two before the narrator describes this peeling of the orange, the narrator also mentions Adolf Eichmann's trial post-World War II and post-The Holocaust, and this helps to set this theme of evil and where it comes from, and it helps track the path that the rest of this story is going to go down. Anytime you bring up the Holocaust into a story, it has to be intentional, and evil is going to be a theme. Eichmann's trial was famously publicized and written about by philosopher Hannah Arendt, who characterized his role in in the killing of so many people during the Holocaust as what she called the banality of evil. And what is perhaps striking about the trial and the interview and the interrogation of this mass murdering person is that he didn't seem to be a frothing at the mouth sociopath. He didn't seem to really be a ultra strong believer in Nazi ideology, there seemed to be a little bit more of a lazy complacency there. An average guy just following orders and using the day-to-day -day routine that comes along with his job in order to mask and create a simple and easy to understand narrative for himself for the evil that he was doing. This idea of the banality of evil is a similar idea to Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, the basic idea being that much of the killing done during the Holocaust was done as a result of situational factors, obeying orders, conformity to the group, obeying authority figures. And of course, this is really scary because it implies that Ordinary, average people can be capable of incredible evil, and also that that evil may be just laying in wait all around us. And just like 
Adolf Eichmann, average lazy complacency may be as responsible for evil as anything else. Again, he didn't believe that the orange was there. He forgot that the orange wasn't there. Back to the story now. The girl's father dies, and she comes in to a good sum of money. She uses some of that to travel to North Africa. As the narrator mentions, the girl doesn't seem to have a lot of friends or close family now, especially that the dad has died, and she's a little bit nomadic, moving from place to place. And so a few months later, she comes back, but with a new guy. The guy is in his late 20s, tall, handsome, but not overly so, quote-unquote nice enough, seemingly pretty normal. It's unclear why the girl wants the narrator to meet this new guy. We certainly have this mysterious love triangle that seems to be unfurling here. And we notice that he seems to have money, he seems to be rich, he has a nice car, but all of it is cloaked in mystery and secrecy in a way. He says that he does trading, but doesn't really elaborate on where he gets his money. And it's here in the story that things get strange and the concept of unreality starts to filter into the proceedings here. The girl and her new boyfriend come to visit the narrator's house. We learn that the narrator's wife is out of the house somewhere, not exactly sure where. And right away, this is bizarre because at no point earlier when he was in this strange relationship with the girl, did he mention that he had a wife? So right away, you're wondering as the reader, is the wife real? I mean, the girl ends up sleeping in her bed. The narrator at one point wonders if he can just curl up in bed next to her, never seeming to worry if his wife will come home. It's all a little bit bizarre. Before the girl and the new guy arrive, he's sitting at home crushing apples. He probably eats about seven or eight of them. We notice this is another fruit symbol. You might be able to argue that the apple is sort of a symbol for complacency, maybe laziness. And we might be able to say that this connects with the narrator's general lack of understanding and his inability to get out of his own way when trying to figure out the whole barn burning situation that happens later, essentially entirely missing the boat. Once the girl and the new guy arrive, the love triangle begins to drink alcohol and smoke weed. The girl passes out in his bed, as we mentioned, and while he's smoking with the new guy, memories start to roll in. He remembers his old elementary school play, where he played the role of a fox who doesn't want to help out another fox because she didn't have the money to buy something, gloves. Here he's demonstrating no compassion, at least as the actor in the play, and we start dealing with these themes of maybe memory, regret, and nostalgia. The guy begins talking about how the weed is affecting his memory, and he says, quote, Smoke this, and it's strange. I recall all kinds of things, lights and smells and like that. The quality of memory. He paused and snapped his fingers a few times, as if searching for the right words. Completely changes, don't you think? End quote. So this new guy seems to be remembering things just like the narrator is, and while he's remembering, he's snapping his fingers, which might be a detail that matters later on in the story. He then goes on to say, quote, sometimes I burn barns, end quote. The guy mentions how easy it is. He simply soaks it in gasoline, strikes a match, and then boom watches as the barn goes up in flame and smoke, 
the narrator is increasingly intrigued, of course, and the marijuana is adding a sense of surreal unreality here. As the reader, we're beginning to question this new guy, and we're beginning to wonder, wait a second, are we really talking about burning barns, or are we talking about something else? And I think Haruki Murakami does a great job in the story of sort of building the tension and slowly making the reader question what's going on. The guy tells the narrator that he wanted to tell him that he burns barns because the narrator writes novels. And in order to write novels, you need to seek understanding and perspective, and it's not necessarily about judgment. So perhaps this new guy is looking for someone to explain what he does to in a way that is not judgmental, but more understanding, which is strange in its own way. But the question of why burn Barnes is something that the narrator asks and is a big focus of this central conversation of the story. The guy's answer is very nonchalant. He basically says he does it because he can. About once every two months, he gets the urge to go burn a barn. He scouts out the appropriate target, and then he burns it. Importantly, he adds that he chooses barns that won't be missed. They might be older or wearing down or more isolated than other barns. And again, we're beginning to wonder, are we really talking about barns here, or is something else going on? The guy outlines his reasoning for why he burns barns in a conversation with the narrator. Quote, This might be a strange way to put it. He took off again, spreading both hands, then bringing them slowly together before his eyes. But there's a lot of barns in this world, and I've got this feeling that they're all just waiting to be burned. Barns built way off by the seaside, barns built in the middle of rice fields. Well, anyway, all kinds of barns. But nothing that 15 minutes wouldn't burn down nice and neat. It's like that's why they were put there from the very beginning. No grief to anyone. They just vanish. One, two, poof. The narrator says, but you're judging that they're not needed. The guy responds, I'm not judging anything. They're waiting to be burned. I'm simply obliging. You get it? I'm just taking on what's there. Just like the rain. The rain falls, streams swell, things get swept along. Does the rain judge anything? Well, all right. Does this make me immoral? In my own way, I'd like to believe I've got my own morals. And that's an extremely important force in human existence. A person can't exist without morals. I wouldn't doubt if morals weren't the very balance to my simultaneity. Simultaneity? Right. I'm here and I'm there. I'm in Tokyo and at the same time I'm in Tunis. I'm the one to blame and I'm also the one to forgive. Just as a for instance. It's that level of balance. Without such balance, I don't think we could go on living. It's like the linchpin to everything. Lose it, and we'd literally go to pieces. But for the very reason that I've got it, simultaneity becomes possible for me. The narrator says, So what you're saying is, the act of burning barns is in keeping with these morals of yours? The guy responds, Not exactly. It's an act by which to maintain these morals. But maybe we better just forget the morality. It's not essential. What I want to say is, the world is full of these barns. Me, I got my barns, and you got your barns. It's the truth. I've been almost everywhere in the world. Experienced everything. Came close to dying more than once. Not that I'm proud of it or anything. But okay, let's drop it. My fault for being the quiet type all the time. I talk too much when I do grass. End quote. Okay, a bit of a long quote there, but I do think there's a lot of things going on under the surface as the guy is explaining his reasoning for burning barns. First of all, I think there's a bit of a 
naturalistic fallacy in his reasoning. He seems to be saying that the barns are there, they're waiting to be burned, and it's only natural that I should go and oblige them. And because it's natural and I'm simply doing what happens in nature, again by his argument, then there is a morality to it and this can be seen as maybe a good thing. He mentions at times this idea of simultaneity and balance and his morality may be connected to this naturalistic idea of balancing the scales. He also seems to mention a little bit of moral relativity. He tells the narrator that, hey, I've got my barns, you've got your barns, who's to say what's right and wrong, right? At one point, he even says, morals are not essential here. Basically saying, that's not the question that really needs to be answered at this moment. And so we as the reader are left to ponder these ideas. And we're wondering, does he have morals in his own way? And how do we judge this? How should we judge this? These are incredibly complex questions of moral ambiguity and the banality of evil and the overall question of good and evil. And as we struggle with these questions as readers of the story, it's clear that the narrator is also struggling with these questions. Just as Ursula Le Guin said earlier, a simplistic view of good and evil is not going to help the narrator at this stage of his life. Back to the story, the guy says that the next barn that he's going to burn is nearby, very close, in fact. The narrator then says his goodbyes with the girl and the guy. He conks out. Memories of the elementary school play are still haunting him. And he basically wakes up the next morning and becomes obsessed with this idea of barn burning. He maps out the area. He runs a course along a path that he charts where he thinks barns might be likely to be burned. He finally identifies what he thinks is the barn waiting to be burned. One thing you might wonder is, does the guy tell the narrator all of this stuff about burning barns because he wants the narrator to burn barns himself. The narrator, in fact, wonders this himself, and he's, in fact, questioning his sense of self a bit during this section. Of course, we as the reader have probably figured out that there is no barn. The narrator thinks he is seeing and doing and understanding one thing, but that's really not what's happening at all. And just like the pantomime peeling of the orange, what the narrator is seeing is not really what's happening. Eventually, about a month or so goes by in the story, he sees the car that the guy drove in a nearby coffee shop, and he goes in to talk to him. He's questioning himself a little bit before he goes in to talk to the guy saying, quote, though maybe that was a mistaken impression on my part. I have this convenient tendency to rework my memories, end quote. Again, we're dealing with missing things, absences, gaps in memory, disappearances, but the guy and the narrator have a normal conversation. They talk of seaports and shrimp. Nothing seems to be amiss. The narrator asked the guy if he burned his barn, and it turns out he did, and the narrator completely missed it. The guy says, quote, All I can say is, you must have missed it. Does happen, you know. Things so close up, they don't even register. End quote. The narrator expresses his confusion. Things aren't making sense. Clearly, he mapped out the whole area. He identified the barns, and none of them burned down. So what could possibly be going on where this guy is saying he did burn the barn? Eventually, they start talking about the girl who they haven't seen in a while. The guy begins 
to snap his fingers just like he did earlier when he was thinking about his memories and maybe his memories of barn burning. And the guy says, I think I know that girl pretty well. And she absolutely hasn't got yen one. No real friends to speak of and a dress book full of names, but that's all they are. She hasn't got anyone she can depend on. No, I take that back. She did trust you. And I'm not saying this out of courtesy. I do believe you're someone special to her. Really, it's enough to make me kind of jealous. And I'm someone who's never, ever been jealous at all. End quote. So just like the barns that the guy was describing as being ripe for burning, isolated, worn down, no immediate neighbors that are close to it, the guy is basically saying that the girl was ripe to be burned as well. And of course, the implication at the end of the story with the girl totally disappeared is that she was the one who was burned. Maybe this guy identifies isolated women or people who come into a sum of money and then he kills them and then takes the money and that's how he has his fortune. But it's pretty clear that by the end of the story, that's our basic understanding of what happened. It's a great ending to the story and this is really one where rereading it multiple times always gives you something new. And of course, as the reader, we're really wondering by the end, what is this story really about? Ultimately, I think a lot of it is open for interpretation, but I do think there's a couple of interesting things to note. First of all, I don't think it's a coincidence that none of the characters have names. And this really feeds into our theme of ambiguity in the story. The idea of missing what is in plain sight. Obviously, in hindsight, it seems like barn burning is a metaphor for the murder and disappearance of this girl. And it's very clear that the narrator probably could have put the pieces together, but he missed what was in plain sight. He was blinded by his own set of beliefs and judgments and maybe blinded by what he wanted to see. Another connected theme to this idea is that sense of unreality that we talked about. What is real? And we have plenty of reasons to actually distrust the narrator. We talked about the wife being mysterious. She's never even mentioned until about halfway through the story. The age gap in the relationship between the narrator and the girl is notable and potentially concerning. He does have this sort of complacent and laissez-faire attitude and really curiosity about this barn burning and maybe about evil in general. We talked about the apple maybe being a symbol of this complacency, and we talked about how the guy says morality is not really the issue here. And instead of the narrator questioning that and elevating morality in his assessment of the guy and maybe pushing back against things like the naturalistic fallacy and saying, hey, just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's morally good. Instead of making objections like that, he seems to go along with the story and miss the bigger picture as a result. Another theme of the story might be the idea of memory. Both the guy and the narrator seem to be flooded with these old remembrances, and whereas the guy seems to be snapping his fingers when he's remembering, and for him, Memory is feeding into his objectives, although they are evil objectives, of course. For the narrator, he can't seem to wrap his head around the memories of the elementary school play. He seems to be haunted by things like this. He says multiple times that his memories sometimes rework themselves, and as a result of not being able to figure out his past, he's unable to 
chart a path forward. And just as disappearances and absences play a role in the themes of the story, obviously the disappearance of the girl at the end connects all of this together. And we do have these metaphors for things that both are and are not, something that both is and isn't. Things disappearing, the pantomime of the orange or the tangerine, is it there, is it not there? Does the wife exist? Does she not exist? You might also wonder the relationship between the narrator and the girl. To what extent were they together or not, platonic or not? Could the girl have been the narrator's wife? So these questions of reading between the lines and trying to figure out the spaces and gaps in between things are evident, for me at least, when reading the story. I think you might also argue that class struggle and wealth inequality could be playing a big role in this story. The rich guy basically shows up, uses up the poor girl, and basically consumes her. This story takes place in Japan, but the short story was actually adapted to make a Korean film, which is amazing. It's called Burning. And as we know, many of these Korean films, especially in the last 10 or 20 years, very much depict wealth inequality and class struggle as central themes. And I think it's no coincidence that that idea seems to be going on here as well. Another theme of the story, as we've kind of hit on here a little bit, is the idea of relationships. What are our ethical and moral responsibilities? to relationships and friendships and acquaintanceships. For example, to what extent was the narrator morally obligated to figure out what was going on with this new guy and to prevent what happened from happening? Do we have obligations to friendships or relationships that ultimately burn out or fade away and disappear? all difficult questions to answer. Another theme might be the idea of obsession. So there's no doubt that the narrator does become obsessed with barn burning by the end of the story. He's mapping out the barns, he's charting out the paths, he's trying to figure out which barn's going to be burned next. He's thinking about it all the time. And of course, as we figure out by the end, the barn burning symbolizes the girl disappearing, so it might be logical to wonder this idea of obsession, is it not just about the barn, but also about the girl, again, who's much younger, and with him being married, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that maybe there is some sort of unhealthy obsession going on between the narrator and the girl that we're missing because of his lack of memory or the murky nature of of the unreality of the way the story is told. I would also argue that the narrator's obsession with figuring out which barn is going to be burnt and figuring all that stuff out all perhaps misses the larger point, and the narrator misses this point, which is, do we want to live in a world where anyone can burn barns based on their own rationale? I do think that by sidestepping the question of morality and the guy who burns barns intentionally does this by saying morality is not important here, this helps to allow the banality of evil to creep in. The guy doesn't really know or care all that much that he is evil. He has a seemingly reasonable explanation, to him at least, for why what he's doing is totally fine. And maybe the question should be, what do we do with that as people who care about other people? By allowing the guy to sidestep the question of morality, you could argue that the narrator feeds into this idea of the banality of evil by being complacent and sidestepping those questions of morality that are difficult and ambiguous instead of trying to tackle them head on. Another theme 
that connects to the idea of obsession is really the whole concept of something burning. It burns bright, but ultimately ends up burning too hot and consuming everything in its path, and then it's gone. So I think you could say the narrator's relationship with the girl, the guy's relationship with the girl, all of it is burning and gone by the end of the story. You could also connect this to the concept of evil more generally. Evil tends to burn bright and hot, but it ultimately consumes leaving nothing left to care about. As George R. R. Martin said, fire consumes, cold preserves. So whether it's the banality of evil or the concept of burning or relationships and obsession, class struggle, memory, morality, reality, and the idea of evil dressed up in plain clothes hiding in everyday sight, injustice and suffering hiding in plain sight, the narrator says, quote, although just now and then, in the depths of the night, I'll think about barns burning to the ground, end quote. When I read that line, I think about this story and complacency and our role in pondering these huge ethical and philosophical issues that are outlined in this story and beyond. And just like the narrator at the end of the story, I'll be thinking about barn burning for a long time. <laughs> 